Hello everyone and welcome to another video. So we are now on to week two of our classical control theory class. So let's talk about where we're going this week. Um, what I would like to do is let's zoom in on the center picture. Remember during week one we talked about how this was sort of the overall roadmap and motivating picture that outlines pretty much all the things that we're going to do in this class. Um, what we're going to be doing doing during week two is again we're staying on the top on the system modeling side and more specifically I want to start looking um, at a couple of other techniques and tools that we can bring to bear to the system modeling aspect namely how do we develop the mathematical model and then once we have that mathematical model we're going to start developing some techniques to uh, come up with solutions of that mathematical model either analytically or numerically so again this is where we're sort of heading um, in terms of the overall motivating picture let's look at how this manifests itself in terms of the lecture schedule for this week. So, the first three videos that I want to call to your attention are, you'll notice they're all marked as optional because again, these three videos are ones that we already discussed in AE501. So again, I know everyone has seen these already, but again, if you need a refresher with Simulink, um, feel free to check these three videos out, right? This will get you started with Simulink. This will get you um, modeling ordinary differential equations in Simulink. And this will get Simulink talking with MATLAB together nicely. So again, we talked about all three of these before. So I think everyone knows what this does. Um, and again, the reason we care about this is because Simulink is going to be our numerical system of choice for both modeling and, and doing the system modeling and predicting how the mathematical model is going to behave, but also to do the control theory implementation uh, when we get down to that, you know, kind of around maybe week four or five. Okay, so those are three optional videos to get you started. Then let's talk about what we're actually going to do. So this first video is looking at using a MATLAB function called MinReal which stands for minimal realization, to perform what's called pole zero uh, cancellation when you have a transfer function. So if you remember during week one, we already started developing transfer functions for our various dynamic systems. And now we're gonna see, there are some situations you can get into where you might need to perform what's called pole zero cancellation. And again, I think once you watch this short little 20 minute video, it'll make sense what this does. Okay, then um, let's talk a little bit about some general theory. Okay, so we talked about how we have a transfer function system which is sort of a mathematical model of a dynamic system correct and now we want to start thinking about solutions or understanding or using this mathematical model to predict the behavior of the system well final value theorem is one way that we can actually predict the steady state or final value of a particular transfer function or a particular system um so we're going to watch this video here to learn how to use this again i i I should maybe call out that if you actually are uh, remembering keenly from AE501, this was an optional video back when we were discussing the Laplace transform in AE501. So some people may have already seen this. If you haven't, um, it's it's now a required video. So make sure you watch this because we are going to be using this. Um, it's going to be somewhat related to the next video, which is also called which is called DC gain. And um, again, this relates to the steady response of the system when you subject it to a constant input. Um, so these two videos are talking about how to analytically predict uh, what a system is going to do once you have a transfer function model in your hand. Okay. Um, maybe to, to, to kind of whet your appetite, I will mention this DC gain is going to come back to us around week five when we start talking about open loop control, which is the basis of feed forward control. This concept is going to come into play later. So um, this is kind of a, a fun discussion topic. Okay, once we have those out of the way, these are again talking about the the kind of steady state performance of a system but oftentimes as control engineers we actually care about the transient or the dynamic response so that's what this video is going to talk about is if you have a first order system meaning there's one state or one pole or one integrator however you want to think about it you have a very simple system what are some performance metrics that are associated with it things like um uh, rise time or steady state error, there are different metrics that come into play when you have a first order system. So that's what this video is talking about. Then let's get a little more complicated. Instead of having a first order system, what if you have a second order system? So now there are more uh, performance metrics, things like percent overshoot and other things that come into play when you have a more complicated second order system, which has the potential for oscillation. So these two uh, excuse me, I'm not very good with the highlighting. Here we go. Those two are going to help us a little bit talking about performance metrics 
um, for first and second order systems. And these are sort of the standard set of performance metrics. The last video that I'm going to leave you with this week is, again, it's optional here. But another very popular performance metric that, um, that maybe sometimes doesn't get as much publicity as some of these other ones down here is this idea of time to double. This is very important on things like, uh, like aircraft where you care about the performance of how long will it take for an unstable oscillation to double in magnitude. This is a very critical idea. So um, I thought I would just throw this out there. If you're interested, feel free to check this out or skim it or just see a, just the idea of what is time to double. I just wanted to put this here as a potential optional viewing just because it fits in very nicely with our discussion of different performance metrics. So all of these will hopefully get you a nice bag of tools to help you characterize the performance of a dynamic system. Okay, so that's the game plan and the roadmap for this week. Let's go and jump over to the homework and see how this is uh, reinforced. Okay, so let me pull up homework two right next to it. So here we are. So let's just talk through this. So problem one, um, this is actually a little bit of a holdover to our previous week one. Remember we were talking about block diagram algebra at the very end of week one? Well, this problem sort of deals with this. So you've got, let's say you've got two systems. System one has this first order dynamics. System two has this second order dynamics. It, it really doesn't matter what order they are. It's just two different systems with two different sets of um, dynamics. So part A is really pretty simple. It's just get the transfer functions of system one and system two. So we're gonna call that G1 and G2 respectively. Okay, now let's say you have system one and system two and pretend that you're gonna connect them together in a uh, block diagram like this, okay? What do the poles of the closed loop transfer function look like in this case in relationship to the poles of these two individual open loop systems one and system two, okay? So that's what part B is, okay? Pretend you connect it up like this and how does this overall system behave? Uh, in relationship to the other, uh, the original two, okay? Then part C is, okay, what if you connect them in a different way? So instead of connecting them in parallel like you see in part B, part C is looking at, okay, let's connect them in series. And then ask the same question. How do the closed loop poles of this connected system relate to the original poles of G1 and G2, okay? And then lastly, part D is, okay, let's try a third connection architecture, something like this. What do the poles of the closed loop transfer function look like with respect to uh, poles of G1 and G2? And again, what I'm uh, what I'm I'm asking people to think about here is um, we're building these different types of more complicated systems, and we're asking when you build them in these three different ways, do you have any hope of changing the dynamics or the behavior of the system? Okay, so that's kind of what we're asking for. Um, and, and we're stepping through the process this to get that answer, okay? So that's what I'm sort of hunting for in problem one. Problem two is, okay, let's say you've got now, somebody gave you a mathematical model of the system, right? So again, let me just pull over our little picture, right? This is our motivating picture. Someone drops this in your lap and says, okay, here's a mathematical model of my system. It happens to be modeled by a transfer function that looks like this, okay? Now, assume that the input looks like this. It's, uh, it looks like it's just a ramp of, of slope three, right? So this, this input force or input, whatever it is, it's just growing linearly with time, okay? If that's the case, what does the output look like, right? What does this signal do in response to this as an input signal, okay? So you should be able to compute that um, and in fact, compute that you can you can compute that analytically, right? Using Laplace techniques that we've talked about previously. So you should be able to have a closed form expression for y of t equals some expression. You should be able to just plot that for two for for two seconds of data, right? Now, what's interesting is you're going to do uh, you know a non-trivial amount of work going through part A and part B and part C to get these three. You're going to have to do some calculations. You're going to probably have to do some Laplace transforms, things like that. That's all fine and dandy, and that will get you an answer for what the system does um, all the time. Now, if all you cared about was the steady state value of the signal, like where does it go to infinity, could you instead skip a lot of this, save yourself a lot of work, and use something like final value theorem here to predict ahead of time what the final response of the system would be? And once you predict that, you should be able to check, does that agree with what you got in part C? So remember, part C is the complete solution. It tells you what the system does at any single time. 
Final value theorem is just going to tell you what the system does at t equals infinity. I just want to see if these two uh, align and agree, right? So again, don't overthink this problem. It's not that, not hopefully it's not too bad. Okay, problem three gets a little bit more complicated, but not too much. This is a really, I mean, at the end of the day, you stare at this thing long enough, it's a spring mass damper system, right? It's the same thing we've been studying uh, in the beginning of AE501 in any of your undergraduate mechatronics classes. Um, controls people, we love spring mass damper systems, right? You know at the end of the day, at the end of the day this is just some second order ordinary di differential equation, and it's most likely linear, right? So part A is just show me that, <laughs> right? Show that you get a linear second order ODE out of this system, okay? So uh, maybe what I will mention is the input here is a force, right? So this U of T I'm trying to draw here is you put some force on this block and you get to control it. And we're measuring the deflection of this cart from some equilibrium position. Let's call that positive Z is going to the right, okay? All right, so now part B is saying it, it's actually, it looks a whole heck of a lot like this other problem up here, right? It's just you got some input to, the, to this system. In this case, you got some complicated input. It's actually piecewise, right? It looks like it does something like this for the first 9.7 seconds. Then it does nothing. Then it's just constant 6 for t greater than 15, right? So anyway, you've got this funny piecewise input signal, right? And now let's assume you have some initial conditions on this. Like apparently the cart starts 2 meters to the right and at rest, right? And I'm going to give you some constants so you can plug into this thing. Um, all I want you to do for part B is explain how you would analytically solve for z. In fact, it's pretty much what you did in part two, <laughs> correct, right? Part two is you analytically solved for the solution. Problem three, I'm just asking you, okay, if you had something more complicated, how would you do this, okay? So you don't, I'm not asking you to actually do it. I just want you to explain in a couple of sentences what your strategy would be. The reason being is I think when you explain this, you're going to see it's, it's, it's going to take a couple of steps. It's not trivial, right? You're going to have to do some stitching. You're going to have to do some stuff. It's, uh, it's, it would take some time. Instead, what I'd like to do, instead, uh, let's punt and be lazy, and let's just have Simulink numerically solve this for us. So the last part of this problem is basically build this system in Simulink and just hit the play button, right? Have Simulink numerically solve the system using these, this initial condition, using these constants, and just let it rip and just have Simulink do it, right? So again, um, if you need a refresher on how to get that to happen at Simulink, here, here are the related videos, okay? All right, so problem three, it's, it's do a Simulink, a Simulink simulation of a very simple linear system over a spe specified time window. The only thing that might be interesting is in Simulink, you're going to have to monkey around with how to generate this kind of interesting signal, okay? Okay, so problem three is going to really warm us up for the grand finale of this week is... All right, now let's get maybe a little bit more complicated. Let's go ahead and let's say you got this weird pendulum system here. So this pendulum, it's it's a massless rod here with a big old uh, you know mass M at the end of it, and then on the other side it's connected with this spring, right? This spring is connected to this track, which this little wheel here it's free to translate horizontally, but it can't move up and down. What I'm trying to get at is that the force U on the end of this spring, uh, it's, uh, well, sorry, huh? I'm getting a little ahead of myself. The sp force on the spring is always vertical. And also this force U that you are using to control the system, it is also always vertical. So it's a little hard to explain. I, I think, I think hopefully that makes sense. What I'm getting at is the spring force and the control force are always aligned in the same direction. Now their magnitudes could definitely be different, but they're aligned. That's how I want to model this system. That's just our choice, okay? So all I want to do here in part A and B and um, C is again, go ahead and get the equations of motion of your system, okay? So again, get a mathematical model of the system. What I think it's going to come out to be is it's going to be somewhat nonlinear, right? So it's going to actually fit this form right very well. Notice this does, this does not say x dot is equal to ax plus bu. It's some nonlinear set of dynamics right here. And you can see that, right? Because as this thing rotates, I'm sure sines and cosines are going to work, weasel their way into their, the equations of motion. So 
this thing at the end of the day um, should be nonlinear, right? Um, oh, and I guess I even I even put the little comment hint here, right? The spring force is always vertical, okay? Okay, now what I'd like to do then in part D is okay, if we got a nonlinear set of equations, can I make these things linear by by approximating something? So maybe you make some small angle approximations or things like that. See if you can get some of these nonlinear terms to go away and basically see if you can make it so this is now a linear system. So now at the end of part delta, you have two systems. You have the full complicated nonlinear system from part C and you've got a little bit more simple system in part D, okay? And with this simple linear system, you should be able to compute the transfer function of how does this control input force affect the angle theta, right? Okay, and now once you've got all of those mathematical models in place, we might now need to start thinking about, okay, how are we gonna solve those mathematical models, both the nonlinear and the linear model? Right? We need a solution for both of them because we would like to compare them and contrast them. Okay, So that's what we're going to do um, next. Okay, So I'm going to give you some constants for this thing. And now what you should be able to do, now that you have a, uh, a linear model, you've got some constants in here, you should hopefully be able to make some estimates of what the system is going to behave like. Okay, So that's what part F is. It's saying go ahead compute all of these performance metrics that we learned about in this video and and let it rip okay um part g is is optional um the reason it's optional is because i didn't want to cram in this video right now i think you have enough videos to watch for week two so instead i punted that to week three <laughs> so that's the reason i'm making this optional we eventually will get to the linear system analyzer so matlab has a tool called the linear system analyzer that is going to help you calculate some of these things so part f is do it by hand right calculate it using techniques we talk about in this video right and part g if you're so inclined feel free to fire up the linear system analyzer it's literally this command in matlab or if you want to get a jump start on week three and just watch this video to see how you do it you can totally do it here but again this part g is optional i'm going to ask the ta to just ignore it so don't don't worry about it but i just thought i would put it out there so you understand why this is optional and why it's here okay and then let's keep trucking um now what i'd like to do is okay, we made all these predictions, we made all these models, let's just solve it, right? So let's go ahead and simulate this thing using Simulink. Um, so I'm gonna give you some initial conditions, I'll tell you what the control input is. Um, uh, this is basically, if you stare at this thing long enough, right, this is basically a step function of magnitude two units or two newtons, um, and it's applied at one second. So it's zero, and then at one second, it becomes two. So again, here's the English description of that input force. Here's the mathematical description of it. You're gonna have to translate that into a block in Simulink. Um, hint, there's a block called step, which will probably do that for you. <laughs> um, okay, so part H, this is the fun part, right? It's gonna be, you build this thing in Simulink, um, and again, just to tie this thing back, you build it using techniques like we talked about in AE501 here. You build the model, you put the initial conditions in, you put the control input in, you hit play and simulate it, and now you can see what both the linear and the nonlinear system do, okay? Now, part I is kind of interesting. Um, I, I don't want to give this away too much, but I'll let you read this. I want you to put in a different initial condition and just, again, hit simulate again, right? So this should be really easy. If you got part H done, all part I is, is changing the inputs and changing the in initial conditions and hit run again. Okay. Um, yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah. And I think I'll shut up right here and I'll let people think about this and maybe we can talk about this during office hours. So with that being said, I think this is probably a good spot to leave it. Hopefully uh, everyone is making good progress on homework one. Remember that's due pretty soon. And now you know where we're going for homework two. So we'll hopefully be able to have some discussions at office hours next time. So email me if you have questions. Otherwise, um, I look forward to talking with everyone at our next office hours. All right. Thanks, everybody. Bye.